Jesus, I just, Lord, I come before you. Jesus, and I, I, I don't even know how to say words right now with how amazing you are. And Lord, I feel your heart beat. Lord, I feel the, that you, your desires for us, Jesus, and I am overwhelmed. Lord, my, my heart cannot hold all that I know that you have for us, Jesus. And I just pray that, Lord, <clears throat> though my heart's not big enough to contain it, Lord, may it just flow out anyway. Yes. Jesus, I just, Lord, I ask that you would help me remove myself from this, Lord, that it would just be you. God, I don't want to be, it's not about me, Lord, but it's about you. Jesus, and I just... You know my heart, Jesus. That's what I'm praying. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um, this week, we're going to talk about... Does anybody know what the word portmanteau means? Yeah, okay, a couple of you know. It means you take two words and you smash them together to make a new word, usually cutting them in half somehow. And I love that. That's my favorite sort of thing. So today, we're going to talk about compaction okay this is this is my new this is my this is my word for the week all right let's talk about last week what happened last week last week was was a lot of fun and uh uh it was really it was a different different kind of thing but uh we talked about how love never ends that is very clear about that love never ends it says everything else is going to fade away. All of the things that aren't solid, all of that's going to fade away. Knowledge and prophecy, everything that we do, everything we accomplish, all of it's going to fade away. The only point in which we touch eternity, the only thing that lasts is when we mix whatever we're doing with love. It's the only time that it makes impact. It's the only time that it goes forever. If you want to make an impact, if you want to change something, if you want to touch eternity, it has to have love involved. Love never ends never ends. We also looked in, uh, in Galatians where it talks about how religion and no religion, none, none of that carries any weight. None of that counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. And again, there's that faith and we've mixed it with love and that's its impact. Only when it's mixed with love does it make an impact. He also had a warning in that, that if we're just biting and devouring each other, what are we going to have? Nothing but people consumed by each other. And what has that gotten us? Absolutely nothing, which I would argue is the very problem that we're having right now is we're biting and devouring each other. Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's got the right things? Who's got the wrong things? Who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? We've bite and devour each other constantly. And that's all we are kind of right now is just consumed by that. What really counts is us working, our, working through those things in love. Facebook arguments are not in love. Okay. There's a lot of things that, that we, that we are, fall easily into that we need to let go of. We got to mix those things in with love. Love is a sacrifice. There is no scenario in which you love anything or anyone and you don't give something of yourself in it. There's no scenario in that exists. Love gives. Love is sacrifice. It costs you something. But it's like an investment on a crazy high return rate. Because that little sacrifice feeds so much and it's a huge return on your investment. It's amazing. Because that little love goes out and it makes such a huge impact that it causes love to spread. Love, that little sacrifice is worth everything. And, but you have to be prepared for that little sacrifice and you have to be ready to give for yourself. If you're in a relationship where you gain from it, this is not love. Love doesn't gain, love gives. And we have to remind ourselves of that, especially if you're married. <laughs> especially if you're married, that is a huge thing. You've got to have that love. 
Everything we believe, everything we do, everything we want needs to be held into the light of love. What do you have? What do you believe? What are these things that you do if it doesn't hold up in the light of love? If it doesn't have an impact to be given in love, then it is not worth your time. It's worthless. It will pass away. It won't have an impact. If you believe in something, then you have to find a way to love somebody through that. Otherwise, it's not worth anything. It has to be mixed with love. It has to be given in love. So let's talk about compaction. <laughs> love causes action. Okay? That, there, it, it is, it, there's no way to separate that. When there's love, when there's true love pouring out of your heart, it causes action. Love is not a passive thing. It's an active thing. You can't, you can't love someone or a cause and not act on it. I love my kids. That's why sometimes, begrudgingly, I get up to take care of them. Or I do things to take care of them, even though it may not be what I want to do. Okay. Even though most of the time it is not what I want to do, I love them, and so I take care of them. That love causes action. When you care about something, when you love something, it has to have action. If it doesn't have action, then there's chances are you don't really actually have any love in there. Love causes action. And that's something you have to be really able and ready to examine and be honest with yourself. Sometimes you've got to peel back some layers in this self-examination and it's... We've, we've deceived ourselves because of our pride that says it's pretty nice under these layers. And then once you start tearing it up, it's easy to downplay the nasty disgustingness that we're finding underneath there. But it takes maturity to really embrace that and be able to look at what's there. If there's no love there, then it's time for a love... Uh, infusion. infusion, thank you. I was going to say, yeah, that was the best word that I, I didn't come up with that one. So thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Love is an action and a choice. It's not a feeling. Okay? Compassion is a feeling. It's something that moves you on the inside. But love is the action and the choice that it takes. There are times that I don't feel like I love Tiffany. Okay? open and honest, okay? But that doesn't mean that I stop choosing to love her and choosing to serve her, even if I don't necessarily feel it in that moment. Love is not a feeling. It's a choice. Love is an action, and I still take, do those things because I love her, not because I feel it. And that's where we've erred a lot in this country is that we've mixed love as a feeling, and it's not that at all. It's way more complex. It's way more powerful. It's way better than just little butterflies in your stomach. So where should I act? I'm sure that through all of this, you've probably been sold that at least to some degree. Yes, I agree with what you're saying. That sounds good. But what does that mean now? And so we're going to start unraveling that a little bit more. What do we do about this? I agree. Yes, love is important. I should mix that with my life. I want that to, things to last, so I want love. What do I do? Let's talk about that. We're going to talk about two people today, and we're going to show them on a good example and a bad example, because that's a really great way of looking at things. Let's talk about Nehemiah. Uh, I have really never read much about Nehemiah. There's, 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 uh, there's no giant slayed. There's no major uh, uh, battles fought. There's no uh, uh, incredible miracles happened. There's just a lot of people working hard. But Nehemiah deserves a little bit more credit than I think what he gets. Um, and as I started digging into this story, it's, it's, reading the book of Nehemiah was pretty awesome. There's a couple chapters where it gets pretty long talking about everybody's working on the wall and it lists all the people working on the wall. Great. I'm glad that their names are in history. That's fantastic. That doesn't mean much to me at all. <laughs> but Nehemiah's heart was, is just in the right place. So let's talk about time period. Nehemiah 
uh, you guys all remember that at some point, the children of Israel have just refused to follow after God, refused, refused, refused. So God brought um, the Assyrians first to capture them, and then the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and then hauled everybody away. Now we get the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, depending on, because that gets you points over there. Um, if you, uh, those are the stories that we get from that, okay? That's that period where the children of Israel are in exile, okay? There are no, no one left in, in, in Israel anymore, or Judah. Then you also have the story of Esther. Well, some, it's disputed on whether or not Esther happened before or after. It depends on who you talk to at that point. But this is, the, the, the Jews have now been given permission to leave, They've been freed from staying in Babylon, staying in Persia. They've been allowed to go back home. So some of them have. Some of them have left. And actually, all of them really should be going back home. But many of them stayed because they were comfortable. They had all, it's all they had known. They didn't want to leave. They had business that was going really well. It was nice. They didn't want to make this journey home to back to nothing. But they should have been going. But they didn't. So we picked up, we pick up in Nehemiah in chapter one and, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's start in, uh, Nehemiah one, one, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel and Hananiah, Hanani, one of my brothers came uh, came with certain men from Judah, okay? His brother was one of the guys who left to help rebuild Israel, and he's come back. So he gets to talk to them. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the, prov in the province who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates are destroyed by fire. This is not a good report, Okay. The fact that he's like, we're in trouble and in shame. That's, it's, it's bad. It's super bad. This is not good. In verse 4, he says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. This broke Nehemiah's heart. We'll find out later on. He's a cupbearer for the king. Okay, He's serving a completely secular job. He's in not following all of the orders to go back. He's just serving. He's staying in, in, um, in Babylon. But this news broke his heart. It changed something for Nehemiah. He was going along. Everything was hunky-dory. And he heard some news. He brought something was brought to his attention, and it broke his heart. And he has the, he has the best possible response to that, which is, fasting and praying and just and crying out to God. And that's what he does. And he says, and we get this amazing uh, snapshot. As soon as I heard these words, I wept, I wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. And now, and now I pray before you, before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing their sins of the people of Israel who have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have also sinned. His prayer starts off amazing because he's reminding God of the, his covenant promise with the children of Israel. There's no blame in here. There's no, uh, there's no pleading here. He's just reminding God where they stand. And he's being well more than honest about how awful they had acted up to this point and how much they have sinned on every front. He's, he's open with that. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that, you're, that you commanded your servant Moses. Verse 8, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, 
Through your outca- though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make the name, my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and with, by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight and fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this, in the sight of this man. Now, here's a little anecdote at the end. Now, I was a cupbearer of the king. This is a fantastic prayer. He's very open about how his wrongdoings. This is a full repentance. He's saying, God, yes, we know we screwed up. And that's why we ended up where we ended up. But please remember the promises that you made for us. And he's just invoking his covenant with God. You will never go wrong with this kind of heart. Okay, you will never, ever, ever go wrong with this kind of heart. This is exactly where God wants to see you. And we're going to see this again a little later on. So he is a cupbearer to the king. In uh, Nehemiah 2.1, in the month of Nisan, wait, what? Um, Nisan, probably, but I just thought that was funny. In the 20th year of the king Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. This guy's a professional, okay? He's, he's a cupbearer to the king, and he is grieving. He is mourning, but when he comes time to his job, he splashes his face with some water, because they don't have soap, and uh, they, uh, he, he freshens himself up, puts a little, a little spray in the mouth, and, you know, he's all ready, and he is as, he's a professional, and he's going to do his duty and what he has been assigned to do, and this guy's on, on top of it here. And now I had not been sad in his presence. Verse 2, and the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. This is, uh, this is points to this king. Most kings would not even, would first of all, not even notice something going on in their servants' lives. Second of all, be attentive at all to this and concerned. Why are you freaking out? And, and Nehemiah is not trying to blubber and sob and tell the king all of his problems. He's being a professional and the king calls him out on it. And he's afraid, okay? This is the same culture if you remember in Esther, where if you go to the king without being summoned, you die, okay? This isn't, this isn't like you get reprimanded and fined, okay? You get beheaded, okay? This is, okay? That's why he was, he's, being, uh, he's being a professional around this guy, and the king calls him out on it, so he was afraid. And the king said to me, and then I was very afraid, verse 3, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, when the pal- when the city, the palace of my father's, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. So he tells him what's making him upset. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? <laughs> oh, and I love this right here. He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. Okay. <laughs> So here he is, he's having a conversation with the king, which he should not be having, right? Like this is not a place where he just goes and says, so king, the other day I was found out some news and I'm super bummed, okay? He's not having this conversation with him. The king called him out and he has said he didn't lie. He didn't hide it. He just, he, he very succinctly said, this is what's bothering me. And the king says, so what are you requesting then? Which that's, this is clearly the hand of God here, right? This, this king shouldn't care a bit. He's like, so go bring me another wine glass. But God is moving right now. And so Nehemiah takes a second, and I, I imagine that he takes a second, he takes a breath, and in that moment, he's just, oh God, please don't let me die right now. <laughs> and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, And if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. He's basically asking for a leave of absence from his job. 
I, I don't know how, if this was something that happened pretty often. I would imagine it doesn't because you're a servant of the king. You're in a palace, okay? There's a lot of other worse places to be a servant. You're in the king's palace serving. You've got it pretty good as far as servants goes, other than, you know, the possible beheading for somebody else's problem. But for the most part, you live in a pretty good situation, okay? The cupbearer is a really high influential position. You're not in the, the, the dregs of it all, which is true because you're the one that tests it to make sure that it's not poisoned and stuff like that. So there's a big trust thing there. And the, the fact that he's letting him go, like this is clearly the hand of God here. This is not just an easy, like, flip a switch, flip a coin, eh, whatever. It's, this is a big deal. So I gave him a time, which is really fascinating to me. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah and give a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beams for the gates and of the fortress of the temple for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good, for the good hand of my God was upon me. This is a fantastic story. And I, I would love to just read you the rest of Nehemiah because it's a fantastic. He responds so well in every situation. And he gets there and he finds out that there's discord. There's people are basically enslaving each other. The Jews are enslaving each other because they can't pay the interest that they're putting on each other. Um, the wall is taken down. There's people just coming in and out. There's like nothing is functioning. It is quite shameful and it is terrible. Like they're, they're living in a horrible, horrible situation. Nehemiah shows up at night, goes and inspects everything. Then the next day shows up and says, look, I'm here to rebuild this wall and this is how we're going to do it. And he says, God has brought, put this on my heart to do this thing. And he shows up and everybody's like, all right. So they start putting shifts and they start getting people building the wall all, the, all day long. His heart broke for a reason. And, that's, and that, God put that on his heart. That was a very specific thing. And that's why, and as he's building the wall, they rebuild the wall of Jerusalem in 58 days. And later on in Nehemiah, it says the other nations were, this was mind boggling to the other nations where they were like, this is not possible. Clearly their God is helping them because they had opposition. They had people around them. They didn't want this wall being put up. This meant that they, the people they could just pick on and get things from, this was not going to happen anymore. They were losing their power control in the area. They weren't happy about it, but Nehemiah worked so hard and he kept telling the people there were armies that would start to march on them. And Nehemiah told him every single time, remember your God, remember him. He is going to be the one that helps us today. Not going to be our amazing ability to fight. It's going to be our God. Remember our God. And he called them back to that every single time. So fantastic. But like what Mary was talking about, this was something that God put in his heart. It broke his heart, and he did what? He acted on it, right? He responded correctly. He went back to God. He said, okay, God, what is it that you're asking me to do? He fasted. He prayed. He found out what God wanted. And when the time presented itself, he wasn't going out seeking to talk to the king. But the opportunity showed up, and he said, this is it. So he walked out in faith and knowing what God wanted because his heart was broken. He couldn't just be quiet anymore. God had called him to act and he did it. And he did an amazing job. He rebuilt, he helped rebuild the city. And what, what, I, what the thing that I was thinking about was that he was rebuilding some of the wall that Jesus would see then. Like this was the, this was the stuff that was finally built for the rest until Jesus came. Like, how awesome is that? And you can see these things. And I really encourage you to read through Nehemiah because it's pretty awesome. Like that guy, he, remember when dad was doing the King series and they were talking about all the, and this guy chose horribly and did awful in the sight of God. His son rose up and chose awfully and did horrible things in the sight of God. Every, worse than the father. And then this other guy who had done the worst that anybody had said, you're like, how bad does this get? <laughs> this Nehemiah chose correctly all through the, the way. And this guy was solid and it, it's very, very impressive. So he took 
what he had, what God had called him, and he moved on it. So let's look at the other side of this, okay? We, this is the success. Look, let's look on the other side. We're going to talk about Jonah. <laughs> if, if you're having a competition, um, yes, Jude is the shortest book of the Bible, but Jonah can be read in less than 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> like, it is a very short book. It is short, sweet, and to the point. It does not mess around, and it is fantastic. It's really great. So we're going to go through the entire book of Jonah today. I should have led with that. Today we're going through an entire book of the Bible. Jonah in verse 1, uh, in chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. Now Jonah is already serving in a, in a, in a prophetic, uh, uh, thank you, capacity. He's already doing this, okay? Now there's a lot that we can kind of infer about Jonah's character once we're done reading this story. But chances are he's liking his position. It gives him some power. He's kind of a superstar. He's the prophet of the day. He's like in this spot. So God tells him, hey, you're doing, this is fine, but I need you to go talk to Nineveh. Okay. This Nineveh is on its way to being the next Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Like this is, it's bad. Okay. So Jesus, or so God orders uh, Jonah to go out there and talk to him. In verse three, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tar Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It says from the presence of the Lord. Like he can escape that part, right? Okay. So already he's not the brightest of the prophets. Okay. <laughs> but he's, he's clearly, he's not, he's not, he's not all there. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But, it says in verse 4, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And when the mariners were afraid, each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. Okay? <laughs> this guy, I don't know, just this guy is just a weird dude, okay? They're having the worst storm that these guys have ever seen to the point that they're willing to chuck all of their cargo overboard because they don't, they're, they're going to die. And Jonah's asleep down there. Because he wants to be as far away from God as he possibly can be. He's literally trying to escape God. Which we know you cannot do because he's omnipresent. Maybe this was a word they didn't understand back then. <laughs> or at least Jonah didn't understand. <laughs> so the captain came to Jonah in verse 6 and he said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give us give a thought to us that we may not perish. He's like, listen, everyone else is calling out to their God. Wake up and you do the same. We need every, any chance that we can get here, we need every bit of it. In verse 7, and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and it fell on Jonah. Okay? Outed right then and there. Okay? It doesn't say though that he cried out to God at all. That's what this guy woke him up to do. And he didn't do that. Why? Because he's trying to get away from him. So they cast lots. And what happens? It points this big finger right at, jo at Jonah. And he's like, and, and here he says in verse 8, And then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What, what people are you? It's like... Why are you ruining our lives here, man? <laughs> what are you doing? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. In title only, right? This is, this is what's on his business card, right? This is his elevator speech, but it doesn't mean anything to him. He's, try, he's literally trying to escape God, and he doesn't actually fear God right now. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? 
For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said, how mind-boggling is it that he says, I fear the Lord Jehovah, and then immediately in the next breath says, but I'm trying to get away from him right now. And then they said to him, what shall we do with you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more temptuous. Tempestuous. Thank you. I knew somebody would help me out with that. In verse 12, then he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. I know, for I know this because of me, this great tempest has come upon you. Okay. This guy. Uh, but he knows what's going on. And he still is not doing anything about it. He hasn't cried out to God. He hasn't begged for repentance at all. And in fact, he's not even saying, fine, you know what? This isn't for you guys. This is about me. I'll sacrifice myself. No. No, he says, you guys have to chuck me overboard. He doesn't offer it. He doesn't do the honorable thing. He's cared for no one but himself this entire way. And then these guys, okay, these guys are not believers. They don't believe in God at all. But these guys have showed more character in the brief little time with them than, than Jonah does the entire book. In verse 13, nevertheless, okay, so he tells them, the only way you're going to get rid of this storm is you chuck me overboard. So the, so the, in verse 13, it says, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So these guys were like, I'm not murdering this dude. I'm not going to, I don't want that on me. So they gave every effort they could to try not to do this. And Jonah's just, for all we know, he's just literally sitting there, probably with his arms crossed going, I just don't care. I'm get, I'm not, I don't give any effort towards this whatsoever. So verse 14, therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they're saying, look, God, we don't want to be responsible for murder, but we're going to chuck this guy overboard so we don't all die, okay? <laughs> so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. I cannot even imagine how amazing this was, okay? Like, they chuck him overboard, the boat is just rocking like this, and as soon as his head goes all the way into water, or his feet, whatever, however they got him into the water, as soon as all of him went under, the sea just dies down, and the clouds just cleared up, and everything is fine. And like, you know these guys are freaking the heck out, okay? And then somebody says, why didn't we chuck him instead of our cargo from the beginning? <laughs> <laughs> Next time we cast lots first, then we get rid of our cargo. <laughs> he claimed to be aligned with God. And then he claimed that he knew that this whole thing was on them because of him. And then he said, the only way to get rid of me, because I'm not going to repent. I'm not going back anywhere. I'm still going to stay here. I'm going to do what I want. You have to chuck me overboard if you want to get rid of this storm. He is... He's taken no responsibility of anything at any point. And he didn't help them row. He, he, this, he's, been, he's been a jerk, a royal jerk from one end to the other. Um, and then in verse 16, then, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and they offered up a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. <laughs> this is not the way evangelism <laughs> <laughs> but, but highly effective. <laughs> <laughs> These guys were like, you know what? Our gods were terrible. They did nothing for us. This is real, though. Verse 17, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the, to, to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying... So here's interesting. So we've, we've seen Nehemiah's prayer, Right? Now let's look at Jonah's prayer as he's going to come up. And let's, let's look at these and what, what's interesting about them. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the be belly of Sheol, I cried, and I heard my voice. Okay? He's in the belly of a fish. And he's like, from the belly of Sheol, I'm crying out to you. Which I imagine is probably pretty much like hell. Okay? Like, it's probably not great. 
there's, there's, there's digestive things that are probably eating his skin. Like, it burns. It's awful. The guy is, this is not a luxury cruise by any stretch of the imagination. And you heard me. Verse 3, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then he said, I am driven away from your sight, yet, shall I, yet I shall look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. At the root of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out on the dry land. <laughs> I like... I like that it says that God spoke to the fish. It was like he was having a conversation. He's like, listen, this is going to be unpleasant, okay? But there's a guy on the inside of you, and I'm going to need him back now, okay? So if you could be so kind as to spit him up over here, I'd really appreciate it. And the fish is like, fine, I guess. And blah, and there comes this man, okay? But look at his prayer. His prayer was actually genuine. It actually shows a bit of repentance in there. He, he's, but what lengths did he have to go to to get to that point? I think it took three days of him sulking in the belly of a fish in just literally the worst conditions that you can possibly imagine. And because like there's no light, you know, in Pinocchio, it always shows the boat rocking in there and he's got a little fire and like somehow that's ambient light enough to see everything around it's pitch black there is no light whatsoever so he's sloshing around inside of this fish for three days oh blah. i don't even like my imagination is good enough to matt and i don't want to touch it it's nasty so in those three days he realizes all right where i'm at this is pretty awful and so he cries out to his God because he knows God's good for that. And God shows him kindness in this. He saves him from there. It, God is not like, yeah, you know what? You've got a thing coming, Jonah. I am going to make life so miserable on you. But he doesn't. He saves Jonah also. The fish obeyed God better than Jonah did, which is really sad. Um, it's, this fish is right up there with the donkey that Balaam was, <laughs> was driving, okay? Like, the animals are more attentive to what God is saying than we are sometimes. So, Jonah's been vomited up on dry land, okay? I imagine his... This is what I imagine. I imagine he came out sort of albino-like, okay? That, so, that his skin looked just, just white, pale beyond pale. I, and what? Thank you for that. Yeah, pruny is great description. Okay, that is just, the dude was a raisin. Okay, a white raisin. <laughs> so, so he's sitting there on the beach, seeing the sun for the first time in three days, seeing anything. Like, I just imagine his, I, like, I don't know why, but I imagine the color in his pupils was also diminished. Like, I just see this guy just being a faded bleh. Okay, he looks like fish vomit right now. And in chapter three, it says, and then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it the message that I tell you. So finally, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in the breadth. Now, I say my commute is horrible, that I have to go from one end of Denver to the other. It doesn't take three days, though. <laughs> I know, I have to walk. But walking, it may also take that long, too. But just that's how big the city is. Like, that's a horrible commute. It's like, yeah, I work on the other side of town. Well, you better get going. The weekend's already over. <laughs> so Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, 
Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So he traveled one of the three days that it takes to get to the other side of the city and starts telling people the message that God gave him. He doesn't even say, thus saith the Lord. He doesn't do any of the stuff that I imagine was part of the whole rigmarole of what he would do before as he would give words out. He just starts saying, you're gonna, in 40 days, you're going to be overthrown. So he cries out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, this is all he says. So many other times when the prophets, if not every time, when the prophets tell, give a word, they always say, but repent and it's going to be okay. Like, come back to God. Very seldom, if ever, God just gives a definitive, you are going to be destroyed. Okay? He gives all this stuff out, but that is not the message that Jonah gives. In some ways, it feels like he's sort of begrudgingly, he's not even probably yelling it. He's just like walking around saying it. Like he's giving literally the least amount of effort he possibly can and still saying he kind of obeyed it. But in verse 5, it says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. In verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through, through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd of, nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them, let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we not perish. This is probably the greatest repentance ever. One guy gives a half of a message with the least amount of effort he's possibly ever given, and the entire city repents immediately. The king gets off of his throne, throws off his robes, and starts mourning instantly. They're making the animals fast. This is just absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> By far the best response any prophet has ever been given, okay? This guy put no effort towards it. Why? Because God already knew the need of the Ninevites. He already knew what they needed. He was just looking for somebody who was willing and able to go out there and do the work. That's all he needed. In verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said would, he would do to them, and he did not do it. You can never, ever, ever go wrong with repentance. Never, ever go wrong with that. This is the same God who we serve today. And it's so easy to look at this time, God wiped these people out and ordered the destruction of these people. And you're like, where is that God of love in all of that? Because you're not seeing the story that it took place in those people's lives. We're just seeing the bylines of the actual, of, we're just seeing the end results. Here, right here was a spot that God reached out to a very wicked city. It was so wicked that it, that it was bothering God that he was like, we have to do something about it. And God had already ordered their destruction. But every time we're willing to reach out in repentance, to react humbly, not out of our pride, but humbly come before God and say, you know what, God, you are totally right. I am wrong here. And I am willing to, f f to, to let this go. Repentance is always gonna, is always the right response. And these people displayed it in spades. These guys had it. This was amazing. So we're going to start in verse 4. Here's where Jonah's character really starts to shine. And by shine, I mean in a shadowy way. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Okay, so this dude just had the greatest conversion rate anyone has ever seen, and he's angry about it. This guy is just so dense. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. What? 
He's like, God, this is exactly why I didn't want to come here. I knew that you would save them all. Oh, 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 this guy. He wanted to see their destruction. And why is that? It's just like what Mary was mentioning earlier. Is that in his world, and this is where we, this is some of my assumptions on my part, but this is what I'm deducing from the available evidence here. Is that this guy was super high and mighty on his pride. And not only in his pride, but in the nation of Israel was the greatest nation. Salvation is not offered to those Ninevites out there. Those other nasty people. They're getting what they deserve. This is the same attitude that the church has. Oh, we're the church. We're the Christians. We're the ones that God wants to save. Not those other people out there who believe in all those awful things that we're so against. We don't want salvation for them. We want them to burn because of the choices that they've made. That pride of Jonah is inside of us too. That's the spirit that we have so many times because we want to be right. And we want to be right so badly that we are happy to see the world burn because it proves that we were right from the beginning. This cannot be us. God wants, it should not be us. But it's up to us to decide if this is us or not. God is ready. He knows where the people that need the help the most. All he's looking is for able bodies. Not your abilities, but just your able body. Jonah's upset because he was the superstar in the greatest country in the world. And he was called to do the dirty work that he didn't want to do because it required him not being the superstar anymore, required him to not be the biggest, the baddest that there is. But in doing so, he saved a whole city. He, just bringing that message, the whole city repented and looked before, before God. I love his prayer. In verse 2, he says, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. That's our God. He knows him. He knows his God. Every step of the way, this is not a guy who has done any of this out of ignorance. He has full and fully known and understood who God is, what his position is, and what should be going on. He totally gets it. And he has refused to do any of it. Because it's not bringing him enough glory is really what it comes down to. Verse, verse 3, he says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord says, oh, this is such a great question. Do you do well to be angry? Are you happy that you're angry? Are you, is this, is this good? Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat in the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in, in the shade until, uh, until he should see what should become of the city. He literally left the city, sat off on the sidelines, and was waiting for a front row seat to watch God wipe them out. The people <laughs> repented. And he, that's not enough for him. He wants to see them burn for how horrible and wicked they've been. He should be rejoicing that some horrible people came to Jesus. They got salvation. That's the way it really is. Like, again, like I said last week, we're all the same. We're all horrible people that need Jesus. I am no better than the other guy down the street who's a heathen, hates God, tattoos the... the 666 on his forehead because he's so anti-God. I'm no better than that guy. I need Jesus. He needs Jesus. Jonah needs Jesus. Nineveh needs Jesus. 
but he doesn't want to see them have salvation because it means that he's not special. He doesn't have an elevated status above everybody else because everyone gets salvation. In verse 6, Now the Lord appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from the discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Even in this moment, man, if it was me, I would, have, I would not have even, oh, I don't know. I don't know where I would have left him. <laughs> I know, but that Jesus has showed him so much mercy. He, he got swallowed by a fish and God could have left him there. But he cried out and God saved him from the fish. He showed him great mercy there. And then Jonah went and did his, what he asked him to do and then sat on the sidelines like chanting their death, which was not what he had asked at all. And God made a, a, a tree grow overnight to give him shade. Such mercy that he showed there. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm to attack the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and that he asked that he might die, and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do, be, do, you do well to be angry for the plant? And he, and he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Man, this guy is so dense, so frustrating. He, like, uh, God showed him grace right then and there with that plant too. It says, buck up, it's going to be okay. This isn't where you need to be. But he won't let go of his pride. He won't let go of that. He's so upset that other people have gotten salvation that he's still going to be there. So God kills the plant and now he's angry about the plant too because he deserved the plant. His pride is off the scales. And the Lord said to him, after he's like, I'm so angry I could die right now. <sighs> and the Lord said to him, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city for which there are 120,000 persons who did not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? And God says, you are more upset about that plant dying than you are this entire city of 120,000 people. That's what you're more upset about. So when it comes to our lives, where... Where's our plant? The thing that we're more upset about that's distracted us from being concerned about the real, true issue. The really big thing. When Nehemiah heard the call, it broke his heart. And he said, something must be done. When Jonah heard the call, he said, nuh -uh, ain't gonna happen. And he ran away. There's two different paths that you get to take from this. When it comes to love, what has love burdened your heart with? What do you care about? What's broken your heart? What bothers you and that you say something needs to be done here? Those, that's the thing that you're being called to. We're all different. We're all unique. I don't think I need to even say that. That's sort of a given, given this crowd. You guys fully understand the uniqueness because that's what we make fun of each other for, <laughs> as being all of us unique. <laughs> and each of us like a fingerprint that's totally unique in design. There, each one of us has a weird way of connecting to other people, of reaching out. Each one of us cares about something a little bit differently. That's where your heart is. That's what love's asking you to do. The question is whether or not we're going to at, respond in a pride way. No, I'm not going to help those people. They believe in abortion. I'm not helping those people. Those people are terrible, worthless people. No, they need Jesus. It may, it may have been a forgiveness issue. 
It may have been. But we have to... Res what? Oh, she was saying that maybe um, his family was killed by Ninevites, and that's what uh, made him not want to forgive them and to ask for salvation. It's entirely possible there could have been a major trauma there. But in Nehemiah's prayer, we see he's, he's fully confessed that how he doesn't stand on any leg before God saying, this is what I am, this is what I deserve, this is how it's going to happen. He came fully saying, okay, I know that we have messed up. Came from a very humble spot and said, I'm just going to follow what you're asking me to do. And Jonah reacts in a very prideful way. That's the call for today. What is it that God's put on your heart? I think all of us have something that we care about to some degree. What has God put on your heart? Are we going to act in a prideful manner or are we going to act in a humble manner? Because repentance every time, maybe you've even botched your, your desire, what God's put on your heart. Maybe you feel like you've already failed at it. But repentance is never the wrong thing to do. That's a great place to start. God will change his plans for repentance. That's amazing. That gives us, that, that's so awesome. While you're still breathing, it's not too late. While you still have breath, you still have a chance to do something amazing. And the sky is the limit with our, with our more than impossible God who loves us and is willing to destroy odds on every level with people who are just willing to go out and obey. That's all that it takes. So this week, that's what I want you to be mindful of. Think about what breaks my heart. What has love asked me to do? And then think about if you need to repent there. But then I, I, I highly encourage you to react in some humility and really say, okay, God, what is it that you've asked me to do? And act on that. Because that's where you're supposed to be. Love, love will lead you to those things. What areas should you help, but you won't because your pride is in the way? Repentance is huge, and it's for everyone, and it's for anyone, and we need to be channels of that. We're not better than anybody. Jonah wrote the book of Jonah, exposing himself and showing how awful he was so that we had that example. <clears throat> and that's, again, the, the same... As long as there's still breath in your lungs, nothing is too late. You haven't missed any, op maybe you have missed opportunities. But God is a God of repentance. God is a God of love and of second chances and of third and fourth and 88th chances. As he just loves a humble heart that's repented. And that's our chance to do something for him. If we walk through this life unscathed, we haven't done anything for his glory. Getting dirty is the only, the only way through this life serving Jesus. Love requires a sacrifice that's going to cost you something. But acting on that heart is, is just amazing. It's going to be so rewarding. So Jesus, we just come before you, Father. Lord, and I just ask that you would remind everyone in here, Lord, that you would tug on their, their heartstring of compassion. Lord, remind them, what is it that they feel like needs to be done? Lord, and then remind us, we need that love in there if we want it to last. Only love never ends. So Lord, I just pray that you would remind us that to respond humbly, to remind us to love Lord, we thank you for that, what you've done, that you've brought salvation to us. Lord, that we would extend that grace and that salvation to other people. That through your eyes of love, that we would care for other people in this world that needs you so badly, just as we need you so badly. Jesus, I thank you. Lord, I repent from being a Jonah. 
and all of the times that I've just wanted to see the other people hurt so that I can be right. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for those things. And in that spirit, Lord, that I want to be a Nehemiah who acts on the things that you have broken my heart for. Jesus, I bless everyone in this room, Lord, that this seed of your revelation, Lord, would sprout great fruit. Lord, I bless everyone here with, a, with their eyes to be open to see you better. In Jesus' name, amen.